When um, I look at uh, Nina Shea's work, uh, I, it's uh, uh, somewhat humbling for a college professor to see somebody who actually puts their uh, skills and expertise so much uh, in the practical public realm. Uh, Nina Shea's um, achievements over the last 30 years have just been uh, uh, remarkable. Uh, she is a, uh, she's a human rights uh, lawyer. Uh, she worked on cases involving human rights and religious rights in the former uh, Soviet Union. In the uh, late 1990s, she was uh, uh, instrumental in pushing for the uh, Federal um, uh, Religious Freedom uh, Act, which has done so much to transform American uh, foreign policy. <clears throat> and uh, she served as a commissioner for many years on the uh, United States Commission on International uh, Religious Freedom. Uh, she has uh, written, co-written um, a number of uh, uh, books. Uh, the titles speak for themselves. Uh, 2011 was Silenced, How Apostasy and Blasphemy Codes Are Choking Freedom Worldwide, uh, Persecuted, The Global uh, Assault on uh, Christians. And I think it's interesting that the uh, Silenced book has many, many interesting features, but one of the most interesting is the foreword, uh, which is by one of the uh, world's most prominent Islamic leaders, uh, the former uh, president of uh, Indonesia and the leader of one of the world's largest um, Islamic uh, organizations. She's speaking to many constituencies who are interested in freedom, who are interested in uh, religious freedom, and if I can put it this way, interested in the fundamental ideas that Baylor is uh, all about. And uh, with, uh, with that, let me please welcome uh, Nina Shea. Thank you. Thanks so much, Philip. Thank you all. It's a real joy for me to be here at Baylor and to be meeting all of you. Um, and. Um, it's a mutual adoration society with uh, Philip because, I, as I told him, his book on the decline of Near Eastern Christianity is on my nightstand. And that's literally true. I constantly refer to it. It's a wonderful book. Today I'm going to be talking about uh, Christians in the path of ISIS, or the Islamic State. Um, I got an email 10 days ago from a Christian leader out in the Middle, Middle East saying, urgent, please help, please do something. Our village is um, in Syria, Tal Tamir, is surrounded by ISIS. We're trying to fight them off. Can you do anything? I spent that, most of that Saturday calling everybody I knew in the government, everybody I knew who knew someone in the government, and I was um, heartened to find that um, the next day, there were reports, I got confirmation that there were intensive airstrikes that drove off ISIS, that rescued these people, that um, allowed um, them to protect their village for another day. Uh, three days later, the bad news is, I get another urgent message. ISIS has surrounded the same village again. Where are the airstrikes? Um, the I have not heard the results of that. I also went into to gear on that, and, and a lot of other people did a whole network um, trying to get to CENTCOM to send in um, the planes that would drive off these jihadists. Um, the, that was the north side of the Kabor River. The Kabor River is in Syria. It's close to the border of Turkey and Iraq. The south side was attacked on February 23rd by ISIS. They came, the jihadists came out of Kobani. You may have been reading about Kobani. That's the Kurdish town where we have been um, launching airstrikes for the past four months and finally drove ISIS off. ISIS came out, streamed out of that area uh, right along the Turkish border and right over to the Kabor River Valley, which is the Christian area, 33 Christian villages all in a row. Um, the south side did not end up so well. ISIS. Um, killed a number of them. They took hostage 300. They've been missing ever since. That was on February 23rd. And 3,000 were driven out of their villages, out of their homes, out of all their possessions. They fled to the church in Hasaki, and from there they have now gone on to Lebanon because they have no hope of regaining that territory from ISIS. 
Um, these were people who were they're, they're descendants of the survivors of the Turkish genocide. They are um, not Armenian, they're Assyrian. Um, they, after being pushed out of um, Turkey 100 years ago, their great-grandfathers and grandmothers went to, um, uh, went to uh, Iraq, in northern Iraq, and a year after the Iraqi Republic was established, there was another massacre against them. And they then fled to the Kabur River Valley. So you see how the events of 100 years ago are being repeated today in the Near East. Um, in fact, Syria is one of four countries in the Middle East where there are sizable Christian communities. There are only four left of over, say, a million. Syria had about a million and a half. Um, Iraq had, 10 years ago, about a million and a half Christian community. Um, Egypt is by far the largest. It has um, about 10% of its population, eight or nine million Christians, and then there's Lebanon. At least three of those countries, Iraq, Syria, and Egypt, are under threat, under direct threat from ISIS, some more so than others, especially Iraq and Syria. Um, this is the cradle of Christianity, and there's a, a, a religious cleansing, cleansing going on, a cultural genocide, but it's really a religious cleansing. Um, this is more than, um, worse than persecution. I've stopped using the term persecution, even though my last book was called Persecuted, um, because what we're seeing is so severe and so thorough that it's now um, the eradication of the entire Christian presence. These are ancient communities that were um, according to their tradition, Thomas, Doubting Thomas, came to Iraq and, and, and passed the faith on to them. Um, Mark came to Egypt and um, Christianized the population there. It has, as Philip Jenkins has well documented, been in decline for centuries, um, but now what we're seeing is overnight the extinction or extinguishing of the Christian communities for their faith. Um, these are old churches, some are new churches, and where ISIS is uh, now spreading, we're seeing the new churches of Nigeria being uh, cleansed as well. Uh, the, um, so all faith traditions, all Christian faith traditions are affected. I um, met with Pope Francis in June, shortly after ISIS stormed into Mosul in Iraq. And he said at that meeting that there were more martyrs today than in the first century of the Roman Empire, and that is certainly true. But how is it that we know the names of the martyrs from 2,000 years ago? In the Catholic liturgy, I'm Catholic by background and by uh, practice, um, the, uh, we say at every liturgy the names of these first century martyrs, Felicity, Perpetua, Agatha, Lucy, and so on. Um, but how many of us have heard of Gerges, Samuel, Beshoi, Malek? These are the names of the 21 Egyptian cops who were beheaded on February 12th. Um, they were in orange jumpsuits um, in a surreal scene with 21 uh, in a straight line with 21 black clad men with knives, um, ISIS affiliate from in Libya. This was on the shores of the Mediterranean in Libya. And they were, um, according to the YouTube video, which I will not show you, um, the Mediterranean surf turned red with their blood after they were beheaded. Um, the video also was, interestingly enough, not edited um, so that you could see that on their lips, these 21 Egyptian Coptic martyrs were um, whispering the Lord's Prayer. Uh, this stunning icon, done in the tradition of the great icons, um, was done by a young man in Alexandria. Not Alexandria, Egypt, but Alexandria, Virginia. He's a Copt in exile like so many others. How many of us have heard of Dr. Jerry Unamos? Um, he was an American Christian who worked for um, the Care, Cure Hospital for nine years in Kabul. He had been working in Chicago, but decided that if he left Chicago, 
um, treating the poor, someone else would fill his shoes, but no one would go to Kabul. So he went to Kabul to help to treat children. He did it because of his Christian faith. And um, he was shot last summer outside his hospital by the Taliban. Um, then there's Shabazz Bhatti, who is my friend and Tom Farr's friend um, from Pakistan, who's a lay Catholic, who was a government minister, the only Christian in the cabinet, who was working to, um, uh, for the repeal of the blasphemy law there, which has done so much damage to the entire society, not just to Christians, but also to Christians. There's a Christian mother of five, in fact, very um, poor, literate woman on death row for supposedly uh, blaspheming uh, the Islamic prophet Muhammad. Um, we don't know if she did or not because there's no real due process there. In fact, it's a blasphemy to repeat the blasphemy in the courtroom, so we don't even know what, what happened. Um, he was shot on his way to work and killed uh, about four years ago. Um, the Jewish Federation leader in the United States, Ronald Lauder, the heir to the uh, cosmetic fortune, he wrote a piece recently in the New York Times asking who will speak up for these Christians um, because there is um, very little known here in the United States and certainly our political leaders are saying and doing very little to help them. There is much persecution throughout the world, but I want to emphasize that this is most widespread in the Muslim world today. It is, it is a, an ascendant um, ideology of radical Islam. It is intense and it's underreported. This ideology has a positive vision of um, a caliphate, a utopic society, and what um, is part of this extreme vision for them, for ISIS, is, um, is to purify the land for Islam, to eradicate or convert, forcibly convert everyone who's there. Um, Graham Wood, a liberal, has written um, a very interesting and important work in the Atlantic Monthly that I commend to you if you want to learn more about it. I'm not going to say much more about um, the ideology, but he acknowledges that what ISIS wants, his name is Graham Wood, um, Atlantic Monthly, it's a re recent issue. And um, what he does is take issue for President, with President Obama for talking about this in terms of violent extremism, what, uh, which obscures what is really, um, what ISIS is really about. Um, it is a, a religious war against um, anyone who does not share their belief, but particularly against Christians. Muslims, yes, are affected a great deal, but at the end of the day, when the dust settles in Iraq and Syria, there will be Muslims there, but there will be no Christians. So on, um, and, and, this, and then this is, a, I just want to point out that this is a very um, sudden um, and um, new, a newish experience um, because Christians and Muslims have lived side by side in the Middle East for um, centuries. It hasn't always been easy for the minority, and the Christians are a defenseless minority there. They don't have in Iraq and Syria and Egypt, they don't have their own militias, they don't have any power to protect them. Um, and, and they have been able to survive, as we saw in the um, Kabul River Valley, uh, Christians uh, by moving from place to place when things got tough. Um, for them in one place. If they were in Turkey during the genocide, they would move to Syria or Iraq and then back and forth. Now they have fewer options because this radical uh, ideology is spreading. On June 10th last year, ISIS uh, moved into Mosul and every Christian fled overnight. Their houses were marked with an N for Nazarene. Uh, they were stamped with the Arabic letter N or Nun for Nazarene, meaning that they were Christians. Um, the, um, shortly thereafter, they were stripped of those homes. Those homes were redistributed to the jihadists or to, were sold to others. Um, their churches were um, uh, stripped of their crosses. 
They were repurposed as mosques, some of them uh, outfitted with loudspeakers. Um, some were blown up. Um, the Orthodox community, the Christian Orthodox community, spirited away the remains of St. Thomas um, before they arrived. And he, uh, those remains are now uh, safe in Sweden, like so many of the Assyrian Christians themselves. Uh, they, uh, ISIS has, um, again, set about really uh, cleansing or eradicating every trace of Christianity from Mosul, and this is the ancient Christian center in Iraq. Um, they have destroyed thousands of manuscripts, and 200,000 Christians were exiled, were sent, they were given a choice, they could convert to Islam, or they could uh, be killed, or they could flee. And um, so every one of them who could walk left, 200,000 Christians overnight were exiled to Kurdistan. This occurred um, through actually in two, two phases, one from Mosul in June and then in beginning of August from Nineveh when ISIS swept through the Nineveh plain, which is where most of the Christians of Iraq have clustered in recent, recent years. Half a million Muslims also fled Mosul. Um, Mosul is a mostly Sunni city. It's Iraq's second largest city. And um, those half a million Muslims who fled are the moderate Muslims. They're living in UN, in wretched conditions as well, in UN refugee camps, also in Kurdistan. Uh, the ones who remain in Mosul are um, the one and a half or one million now Muslims who, who live in Mosul now. Um, presumably share um, or, or support ISIS. Either they share their ideology as Salafists or they support them because they don't want to be ruled by Shia. Some of them, um, they prefer the Sunni rule because they themselves are Sunni. And some of them are um, Saddam Hussein's generals and former officers. So I, I fear that they are entrenched there. We recently saw the um, the liberation of Kobani that took four months of constant airstrikes. Kobani is in rubble today. Um, I don't think anyone lives there. Uh, I think that will be a cakewalk compared to trying to liberate um, Mosul. If Mosul is, um, if Mosul it remains in, under the control of ISIS, then the, then the Nineveh Plains itself, where most of the Christians lived, will be a badlands, unless somehow we find a way to contain ISIS in Mosul. Uh, again, uh, there is um, underneath, or uh, on top of all this is ostensibly, and it is truly a, a war within Islam, a sectarian war between Sunnis and Shiites, but the Christians are not just caught in the middle. They're not just um, collateral damage. They are actually being deliberately targeted again in this cleansing campaign. Um, fleeing ISIS um, last summer caused untold tragedies. Of course, the houses and property and livelihoods of these Christians, and these Christians are educated, professional people. They're engineers, doctors, realtors, mechanics, people with skills. Um, they're now living in tents and makeshift housing um, in Kurdistan. 7,000 of them are in Jordan. Some have gone to Lebanon. Um, they avoid, they eschew the UN camps where they again are a minority and they feel like they will be discriminated against or harassed or persecuted. And they go to the churches for protection and for this uh, help. They were um, set off in 120 degree summer heat to go uh, stripped of their cars, forced to walk to uh, Kurdistan um, en masse. They were stripped of all their, their uh, possessions. One elderly lady said, uh, begged ISIS if she could um, keep her bus fare so she could take a bus to um, Erbil, and they said no, and they took that after she gave her life savings to them as well. One man, they took his sandwich. Um, it was all he had with him. Wedding rings were taken. They were turned out into the desert. They were, went, sought shelter in some of the nearby towns at first before those were taken over. And then ISIS turned off the water in these towns. One of the, the mayors called up um, 
the Water Works Department in Mosul and said, why, why did you do this? And the answer was, because you Christians don't deserve to drink. Um, one family hit a, hit a little money they had as they were fleeing. ISIS demanded it at a checkpoint. They refused to give it over. So ISIS took their daughter instead. Um, there are sex slave markets in Mosul. Um, this has been documented by the UN uh, Committee on the Rights of Child. Um, there were um, hundreds or maybe thousands of women and girls there and children. Um, mostly these are Yazidis, which is another ancient religion that's not Christian, but it's also not Muslim. Some are, we think, are Christian. There was um, a tragic story of a uh, family that was fleeing and the ISIS just came in, to, the husband was blind, they were the last to leave their village when ISIS moved in in Nineveh. And um, ISIS just took their three-year-old girl, snatched it off the mother's lap, and that was the last they've seen of her. Um, one teenage family was shot in their living room after refusing to convert, and I have a photo of that. Um, most got away with their lives, however, but now they have no, not only no possessions and homes, but they have no future. Um, the story ended for them, the, the story of Iraqi Christianity probably ended this summer, um, but it didn't start there. Um, as I said before, there were over a million, million and a half Christians in Iraq 10 years ago. Um, and over this period, they have been targeted. There have been hundreds of churches bombed throughout Iraq since starting in 2004. One was um, bombed in October uh, 2010 um, when it was full of worshipers and everybody inside was either killed or maimed. Um, there's the Archbishop, uh, Catholic Archbishop of, um, of Mosul himself was assassinated one Lent um, while he was finishing his prayers. Um, the thousands of Christians, ordinary Christians, have been kidnapped for ransom over the last decade, um, causing many to flee, the families to flee once they were released after they paid over their life savings to get them released. Um, <clears throat> during the US surge in 07, um, Salafis, the precursor to ISIS, Al-Qaeda in Iraq, moved into a mixed neighborhood, mostly Christian neighborhood or, or a sizable Christian population in Baghdad called Dora neighborhood. And all of its residents were given the same choice that the Christians in Mosul last summer were given. You either, um, you either convert to Islam or you uh, die or you leave. Um, they reinforced it with a bullet in the envelopes to each family's home. I learned about this from Donnie George. Donnie George lived there with his family. He was the head of the Baghdad Museum. He was the one that, uh, Christian who, um, who hid the, the artifacts from looting back in 2003. Um, girls have been abducted over the last decade for conversion uh, and forcible marriage. Um, it was, um, people, Christians were murdered for not conforming in their lifestyle to the radical Islamists who had moved in, the, the extreme uh, jihadists. Um, those who ran hair salons, video stores, theaters, liquor stores, those commingling co boys and girls in universities were all very, very much threatened by um, these kind of murders. Um, and it's important to point out that this was all um, perpetrated by Sunni extremists, by jihadists, but, um, but it, their, their own governments, as so often in these cases in country after country, their own governments failed to protect them. And that is certainly what had happened last summer in uh, Nineveh and Mosul. And uh, Christians, again, lack the militias, they lack tribal networks, they also lack um, U.S. protection or any other government's protection. Um, so that there is um, a shadow war going on against the, these Christians. Our policy leaders, our foreign policy establishment doesn't even seem to recognize this. The, um, this, um, Egypt, 
um, has the problem of uh, ISIS now on its border in Libya. Um, president Obama went to Egypt and when he first became president and gave his address to the Muslim world from Cairo as if that area was only Muslim. I think it was a huge mistake. Um, Egypt has the, the area's largest Christian population. The word Copt is derived from the Greek word for Egypt. They, fa they trace their faith back, back to um, St. Mark, the Gospel writer, and predate Islam in Egypt by about 600 word, years. Um, Egypt's state policies and practices have long treated this Christian minority as second-class citizens, if not a foreign fifth column. And um, particularly during the Arab Spring, the last part of the Mubarak period, um, we saw a lot of church burnings in one uh, day. Two monasteries were attacked for, um, by heavy machine gun by police because they were making repairs to their monasteries, to their ancient monasteries. Because in Egypt, there's a law that forbids the cops from either building new churches or repairing old ones. So monks were shot off the roof of one of the monasteries for, for trying to fix a leak. Um, the, um, after these uh, 21, they were basically migrant workers, poor, poor men trying to support their families, taking jobs in Libya. After they were killed, um, President Sisi, the new president, um, who overthrew the Muslim Brotherhood government, um, for the first time really acknowledged that they were equal citizens. He um, called for an, a national week of mourning. He, he went to the UN to register um, an, an appeal for help. He um, conducted his own airstrikes against the Libyan branch of ISIS. But the question is, Will he treat these cops in his own country as equal citizens? And this is what the Christians of the area understandably want the most. Um, Nigeria um, is the latest ISIS franchise. Um, this past weekend, um, ISIS accepted the fact that, or accepted the, the, the oath of allegiance by the, the wild man uh, who runs Boko Haram. The ISIS, the ISIS is a new uh, franchise there, it's a terror group. It's been around for six years. Um, the Council on Foreign Relations says that um, Boko Haram has killed 10,000 people last year. Um, it, in January, it carried out what is thought to be the largest terror attack since 9-11. 2,000 people were killed in Baga, a border town in northeastern Nigeria. It barely received any Western notice. Not all of these people, not all of its victims are Christian, of course, but um, because this area, the northern Nigeria, is a, is a large um, Muslim area, but there are Christians there, and they are being religiously cleansed once again. They are being pushed out by extreme violence, in this case, ultraviolence. Um, the um, hundreds of churches have been torched, uh, over a million have been displaced, again, not all Christians. But Christians are its favorite target. Its uh, name means um, Western education is a sin, and those who brought Western education have, were, the, were the Christians to Nigeria. And the Christians today, um, native Christians, uh, run many of the schools. But any school is a target of this attack, um, of their attacks, any school that teaches um, modern uh, secular subjects like math or science. Uh, we you may have heard of the hashtag, hashtag Bring Back Our Girls campaign. That was last summer after 300 schoolgirls were kidnapped while they were taking exams in a small town called Chibok. Um, those that Chibok is a Christian area, it's actually a ghost town now. Um, after this kidnapping, this mass kidnapping. And most of those girls, 80% of those girls were Christian. I've had a couple in my office. They managed to escape in the first 48 hours, but since then, not one of those girls has managed to be reclaimed or found. That was 276 are missing. Um, the head of Boko Haram, um, a man named Shikau, he 
released a YouTube video saying that they've all been married, they all have Muslim husbands now and are memorizing the Quran. So they've been presumably forcibly um, converted to Islam and, um, and are in a situation of sexual slavery. Uh, there, I also spoke, Christians are also targeted in, in their villages in northern Nigeria. I had one man in my office um, named Habila Adamu. Um, Habila had his, um, uh, was the only survivor in his Christian village, uh, only male survivor. Boko Haram came in one night, as is their practice, put a gun to his head and systematically to every man's head in that village and asked them to convert to Islam. Um, Habila lived to tell the tale. He claims it was a miracle. His head was shot off for part of it. His face was, part of his face was shot off. He, was, he has the x-rays and the, um, the documentation to prove it. I've seen them. Uh, he, um, another girl I also had in my office named Deborah Peters. She's a teenage girl. She was the sole survivor in her family. Boko Haram burst into her living room one night and um, demanded that her father at gunpoint uh, renounce Jesus Christ, and instead he replied, um, uh, he, he, he replied Jesus, Jesus, he just chanted the name over and over, and his, uh, he was killed, he was shot. Um, her um, young brother who pleaded for his life um, was also shot that night in their living room um, because, as the gunmen were saying to themselves, he'll probably grow up to be a pastor like his father. Um, so, um, I could go on and on with the facts, but I do want to spend a little bit of time talking about what can be done to help them, because it is a rather bleak picture, um, and there are things that can be done. One is protection. That is the most important thing that these Christians ask for. I had a group of um, Iraqi Christians in my office, uh, well, in, in Washington last summer. We met with um, Speaker Boehner, had a meeting for, with members of Congress, it was a private round table, and they went around the table and they, they um, this was right after they'd been uh, pushed out of Mosul, but before they'd been pushed out of the rest of Nineveh, they were doubled up in families' homes and strangers' homes in Nineveh, and they desperately needed aid, but they did not ask for aid, they asked for protection. Um, why is it that that convoy of 40 trucks that went to the Kabul River Valley last week were not spotted and targeted by uh, coalition airstrikes? How could it be that Raqqa in Syria, a main, major city in Syria, has been taken over by ISIS and is their headquarters? And um, the Christians who remained there, who couldn't get away, were forced to sign uh, a dimmy contract meaning that they would pay a tax, that they would take down their crosses, they would never be seen praying publicly, they would act like Muslims. Um, they were allowed to remain Christian, but they had to act like Muslims. Um, how is it that Turkey is, um, has such porous borders? Our director of intelligence testified in Congress uh, just this past month that there are 20,000 foreign jihadists who have flocked to this region, to Iraq and Syria, going most of them going across the Turkish borders. Turkey's a member of NATO. Um, it, our intelligence says it's the greatest um, foreign uh, congregation for jihad in, in world history. Uh, the, um, in Bosnia, we had 138 airstrikes a day. In Iraq and Syria each, we have had, since September, seven a day. This is not enough. It's not working. Um, I'm against sending U.S. ground troops there. I think that plays into the ISIS narrative and will create more interest from um, radicals abroad to come and help them. But I think that we need to be doing, stepping up the airstrikes. It's a very important, there, we, we've, we, President Obama announced the airstrikes to help the Yazidi people like he should have last summer in Mount Sinjar. He, he um, has used the airstrikes to liberate uh, Kobani for the Kurds. Why isn't he using these airstrikes to help the Christians? And their villages are identifiable, but I do not believe our military knows which villages are Christian. I don't believe that they, anyone has told them or that they um, feel that that is their mandate to protect this defenseless minority while other minorities are protected. 
um, we have to be very, um, um, we should be supporting the Kurds. The Kurds are our ground troops. The Kurds want to do this fight. They are, live up in no northern um, Iraq and northern Syria where ISIS is on their border. They have successfully defended a 600-mile border, but they constantly say that they are lacking in heavy weapons. They are lacking in night vision goggles. They are la lacking in just the basic armor um, for their vehicles. Uh, we insist on sending all our military aid through Baghdad. But the Baghdad government is not at all interested in protecting the people in the north because they are not of the same sect of Islam. That is, the, the, the Kurds or the Sunnis. Um, and they're certainly not interested in protecting the Christians. Uh, the other thing that we have to keep our eye on is reconstruction or resettlement. Um, when Dora neighborhood finally was liberated um, back in 07, um, the Christians never got their property back. Other people were living in their homes. There was no one to adjudicate their, their ownership. So they all left. And um, the Pew Foundation Research Center has found, others have found, um, Age of the Church in Need has documented, once the Christians of the Middle East leave, they never, when they go to the West, they never come back. So, so was the case in Dora. They could not get their property back, and they left. Um, and the third thing is a cultural change. Um, this is an extremely intolerant um, situation. Uh, it's been fanned by Saudi Arabia's textbooks. I've done uh, four studies of the Saudi, four analyses of Saudi textbooks, textbooks that are issued and um, distributed and enforced by the education ministry um, in, in Saudi Arabia. These textbooks call for, they direct students to um, believe that the only way they can assert their own faith is by physically eliminating the other. Those are not my words. That was the com a committee of Saudi scholars that was asked by the king to evaluate these textbooks in 2005, 10 years ago. And it's still, this cleanup has not happened yet. Why isn't our government doing more to press their governments, the governments of the Middle East, that we call our allies that are in coalition with us, uh, to press their religious establishments to show greater tolerance. Um, I have been pressing the State Department for 10 years to do that, and they are very, very reluctant to do so. I have even gone to Saudi Arabia when I was a member of the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom and met with the Minister of Education, the Justice Minister, the Islamic Affairs Minister, talking about these issues. They admit they have a problem. They don't defend these textbooks. They also teach the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, which is a, uh, a fabricated um, text saying that the Jews are going to take over the world. They teach that as historical fact in their textbook on Mohammed. It has nothing to do with Mohammed. It's from the 19th century as pro czarist work, but they teach it as, as, it's, as if it's part of their religion. Um, this is just wrong. It's not part of Islam. That, that, the, the, the protocols is not part of Islam. Um, I just got an email this morning that Kuwait, that a legislator in Kuwait has now um, introduced a law. Um, I don't know if it'll pass or not but introduced a law saying that um, there should be no more construction allowed in, uh, of churches in the entire Arabian Peninsula. Meanwhile, the, the Mufti, the Grand Mufti, who is a cabinet member in Saudi Arabia, appointed by the king, um, has um, called for the destruction of all churches in the Arabian Peninsula. He did that two years ago, has never been replaced. So um, how should... Uh, how should ordinary people, ordinary Americans respond to this? Well, I think it's, we can do a lot. Just as Paul invoked his um, Roman citizenship to demand a trial in Caesar's courts, we can use our citizenship, we can demand that our political leaders um, start speaking up for these, this persecuted defenseless minority and other defenseless minorities like the Yazidis. Uh, the, um, it's important to do this. It's um, through um, not just on your own, but through your communities, through your churches, through your uh, family networks, your friends. It's important to pray. 
Um, you know, my church, Catholic churches that I go to in Washington, we never pray. We never pray for these martyred Christians. I don't know why. Um, the Pope has spoken out on this many times, but we don't have at our intercessions. Uh, we pray for the victims of typhoons and uh, you know peace for the Middle East and so forth, but never specifically for Christian martyrs. We should be doing a lot more prayer for these people. Um, we should also be educating ourselves, and there's lots, a lot of uh, resources available. There's lots of um, uh, open doors, um, uh, aid to the church in need. Uh, the State Department itself puts out an annual report on religious freedom, the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom. But there are many, many religious groups that put out information about uh, these modern-day martyrs. So um, those are my thoughts about how you can help. I think that it's important to help because um, this is our Christian obligation. When, when part of the body suffers, we all suffer. There's the importance of um, the, uh, the lesson of the uh, Good Samaritan. Um, there are human rights reasons for, for taking action here. These, the, this torture, this killing, these beheadings, this is a human, these are massive, epic human rights violations. Why are Christians, why should they be the only exception to um, speaking out on a human rights basis? And finally, there's a national security issue. Um, if we don't defend these Christians, um, pluralism will be, um, be ended completely in this part of the world, um, and things will become only more extreme. So thank you very much. Uh, yes, indeed. So if anyone has any uh, questions, uh, I uh, invite you now. No questions. Yes, indeed. Two questions. Yeah. Number one, uh, considering that you're in D.C. and you have uh, some entry into higher levels of power, uh, number one, militarily, do you, have you heard or is there any indication that the Saudis or the Egyptians have any stomach for breaking ISIS? Um, uh, well, let me just say that I, I do follow the government, but I wouldn't say I, I really have my fingers on any levers of power in there, but I, I do follow. Um, I, they do, and I think that um, leadership is needed, um, and, you know, the, 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 there have been various groups pleading with our government for aid in helping, whether it's intelligence aid or military aid in helping to defeat ISIS. One is President Sisi in Egypt, but, and, and another is, um, good luck, Jonathan, the president of Nigeria. Now, both of those leaders have a lot of problems in their own good governance, we know that. Um, but that's endemic, it seems, to these regions. Um, and um, so our State Department, our administration, is taking the stance that they have to clean up their own governments first. And we did that in Iraq. Um, we insisted that President Maliki um, be more inclusive, all these good things. They, it's important to do that. But in the meantime, ISIS took over a third of, his, of the country, and now we're stuck with that. We don't know how to get rid of them. There's an, an, um, a, an offensive going on in Tikrit right now. They brought, um, the Iraqi government has brought in Iran the, the head of the Quds, the Revolutionary Guard Quds Force, to fight uh, to liberate Iraq, uh, Tikrit. So, um, and, and um, that is also um, creating its own set of problems. So we may see the third wave of extremism uh, go on in, in Iraq. So, um, Nigeria, Egypt, Iraq have all, it was Kurds, um, Kurdish regional government, they have all pleaded for help from the United States, and the United States is withholding it because of, um, on principle and, um, you know, various uh, good governance goals, all of which are legitimate, but in the meantime, the facts on the ground are changing very, very quickly, as we saw last summer, in an irreparable way, and irreparable because we probably won't get back Mosul, um, and ISIS will continue to attract foreigners who are going to come back and threaten us. You know, people from our countries, or from the West, who will come back and threaten us. And because it's, 
creating a one-upsmanship and competition from other jihadi groups, so it's spreading. The second question, quickly, is Christians in the bureaucracy of the State Department, or is it really uh, agnostic or something else? Well, the State Department officials, um, there are a lot of Christians. Tom Farr can tell you more about that. He was part of it, and he was a serious Christian there. Um, but they take their mandate, their directives, from the policy that's set by the administration. And this um, gets back to whether you call this, it really gets back to whether you call this violent extremism or radical Islam. Because if you call it violent extremism, then you're fighting a tactic. And you really don't see, you don't connect the dots. You don't see that Boko Haram is, has the same goals as ISIS even before they swore allegiance. Um, you don't um, go to our allies like Saudi Arabia and ask them to revise the textbooks because you don't acknowledge that that's even happening or that that's a problem. So it really gets back to how you analyze this. You can't have sound policies without sound analysis. And you know, I really, you know, we really need, um, I need, Tom needs, everybody needs, um, who's working on these issues, um, the American people to really wake up and to start pressing their elected officials to demand, to expose this, to expose the flaws with our policy. But even, you know, the Republican candidates, I'm going to be looking very closely to, and challenging them to see what they say and do because, uh, you know, the Bush administration talked about the war on terror. Again, that's another tactic. Yeah. Thank you very much for your presentation. Also, thanks for your work for the Southern Church. Um, I think, though, when you're talking about Nigeria and the U.S. government response to Nigeria, there have to be a few careful things to mention. For example, it is true that the United States military has wanted to do more with the Nigerian government, and the Nigerian government, because of its internal political issues, has put the block in a lot of that. So it's not as if the United States government is, is ignoring the situation. Uh, because of the election there that's coming up, and because of the other candidate is from the north, there's a lot of dropping going on, and there's a lot of, uh, but I, I don't really think it's fair to say that the US government is not trying to, to do more in northern Nigeria. If they could, they have been hindered by the internal political issues. And furthermore, with Niger and Chad entering the equation, sponsored by French troops, that has been a dramatic positive change. Um, yeah, yeah. That's right. Well, the, yeah, now Chad and Niger and Cameroon are all being affected. Um, there's, it's escalating. The Boko Haram violence is escalating within their borders. They are joining together. They're working with Nigeria. We could have been behind the scenes trying to, you know, arrange this much earlier. Um, the, um, we, we, we really have left it to the French to, to start um, organizing this response. Um, they have very serious uh, corruption problems, human rights problems in Nigeria. Um, we could be, we, we've got to be thinking outside the box. We've got to start thinking how we're going to work with a segment of this military. I mean, Iraq's military has human rights problems, but we, we are willing to work with them. Um, but we have to find an elite force that would develop an elite force. We should have been doing this a, a long time ago um, in all these countries. Um, the, you know, we've been giving a billion dollars a year to the Egyptian military for you know, decades, and um, they collapsed. Um, they allowed um, uh, the Christians to be scapegoated in the worst single attack against their churches in 700 years in August 2013. Um, when they were, the cops were scapegoated for the overthrow of the Muslim Brotherhood by the supporters of the Muslim Brotherhood and their churches, their ancient churches were destroyed. Um, but we, we, we have to do more than just give money, obviously, or, or weapons. We have to work with and develop some elite force that we have some, uh, um, are able to train and, and trust to some extent. It's not going to be easy. But I think that the government of Nigeria has understood this um, more recently. I think the January event shocked him, um, uh, where the, it was the largest single attack since 9-11, possibly. Um, so, yeah, it's difficult. But 
this affects everybody. And Nigeria is an oil producing country, the most populous country in Africa. It's a regional, could be a, a great regional force. And conversely, it could destroy the region if, if Boko Haram has uh, a foothold there. Well, um, I think there is a blind spot, uh, certainly, and Tom Farr, I'm sure, will address that later today, because uh, he knows that first firsthand. Um, but I will say that religious freedom is supposed to be a pillar of our foreign policy, that we did launch airstrikes to help the Yazidi religion in August. That was explicitly stated by President Obama uh, to rescue them from Mount Sinjar. Um, the, um, and, 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 you know, the United States always brandishes the Bosnia example of helping the Muslims, of rescuing the Muslims, 138 airstrikes a day, um, as showing the Muslim world that we care about Muslims. So um, there is a blind spot, but I'm not sure it's um, across the board um, for all religions. Thank you very much. Is there uh, just a quick statistical question. Although you mentioned that 10 years ago there was 1.5 million Christians in Iraq 10 years ago. I'm sure that's that you said it in connection or relation to now, and I just missed that little factoid about what's the approximate Christian population might be in Iraq now. Um, it's, no, it's about a quarter million. Yeah, a quarter to a half a million. So the, it's, the churches say that about a million Christians have, have left for the West. Thank you. Since, yeah. Okay. I suppose on the policy issue, I, I, I spoke to one of our colleagues from uh, uh, ASI there, uh, Peter Berger, who had a great uh, observation, which was what he always said, is that the most religious country in the world was India. Mm, yes. 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 Yes.